<clears throat> All right. So greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Project Bring Me Life podcast, uh, coming to you live from Shine Time Studios. Uh, today is February 2nd, 2015. This is podcast number 27, and so please, everybody, help me welcome our guest, Michael Garfield. Awesome. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> pumped. Yeah, sweet. Thank you for uh, joining us on the podcast today, Michael. We definitely appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Yeah, definitely. So usually our first question for everybody is, uh, who are you, where do you come from, and what is your purpose here on Earth? Oh, so uh, we don't get to start out soft. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, I am a writer and a musician and a, an, I guess a mercenary illustrator living in Austin, Texas. Uh, I got, I have a, an educational background in evolutionary biology and I did a, uh, a year of grad school in uh, kind of a, a strange degree program that's basically like psychology and philosophy. Um, I have lived all over the country LA, Orlando, Kansas City, Boulder, Lawrence, Kansas, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and after like 18 months of pretty much constant touring, I, I settled on Austin. I've been here for the last three years. Um, and I, I see my, my work, uh, especially recently as I've, I've started to like slow down a little bit more and focus on uh, not just cr ceaselessly sh creating and then publishing everything that I create uh, out of like this sort of misguided uh, conviction that simply being creative was my like trying to inspire people was my thing um, more specifically, you know, I see, I see the the tone and the content of my communication focusing on where we are right now as a species, moving into a you know a a genuinely planetary culture, um, you know, establishing uh, a sense of identity that transcends our our national borders as well as our species borders and um, the problems that come with that you know and and trying to leverage what it is that I'm doing as as an artist uh, to address the issues of you know the problems of that were that are you know I, I assume most people watching this are you know, in their 20s or 30s, and so it's like our our generation and the you know pretty much everyone alive right now is living through a really freaky time <laughs> on the planet, and so but everyone's got a slightly different perspective on that, and I think that it's uh, you know we can get more into that later, but I think that that um, my my work and and the work of most of the the you know creative people I know sort of provides a, a map or a navigational function of some kind for people trying to make sense of a world where our, our narratives that, that carried us, you know, really solidly through a few hundred or thousand years of history no longer seem to make any sense. And our notion of selfhood is is dissolving in an overwhelming flow of, of information and, and other people's cultures and perspectives. And it's, we're just sort of, you know, we're in the deep end now. And it's, uh, it's you know, I, I see myself as, my purpose is basically providing an, a, uh, an orientation function for people. You know, to help help make sense of 
things because I got all this free time. You know, <laughs> I don't have you know not working for uh, you know a full time employer gives me lots of times lots of time to um, come to my own conclusions and, and research and 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 share what I what I've learned. So joblessness is actually my strength. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good purpose, though, to give people an orientation to what their purpose is or should be. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't presume to know on an individual basis. I think it's really important that people figure that out on their own. But I do love how my work brings me into conversation with people who are, are, you know, maybe just a couple of years behind me on the confusion path. <laughs> And um, you know, and, and I love I love listening to people talk about their lives and their situations, and um, you know, just reflecting to them what I what I hear from them as their big questions and and where they seem to feel that their strengths are and the way that they they're already serving their community. And for the most people, it's just about um, cultivating what's already there, you know, and just recognizing how they're already participating and how they're already serving a greater whole and just encouraging that uh, because you know one of the one of the characteristics of our time is that you know every this sort of it takes a village to raise a child attitude I think is really important and just knowing that that uh, you know different personality types different uh, neurotypes, you know, in terms of like brain structure, structure and and uh, perspective, you know, the different attitudes and the different skill sets and and uh, you know developmental portraits that we bring to the world. It all basically just trusting the the uh, ecological balance of it, you know, and realizing that that. Uh, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. We like where you're going with that. Yeah, well, feel free to interrupt me. Otherwise, that will happen again. <laughs> That's fine. Um, um, would you consider yourself kind of a motivational speaker? You said you don't necessarily have a, a job, but you definitely have been around block and trying to <laughs> speak and give people, a, like you said, an orientation. Well, I mean, I I find it easy to talk, <laughs> and I I uh, you know some of my my biggest inspirations are people that uh, work within a tradition of I guess you know what you would call knowledge artists, you know people that, whose jobs you know uh, or callings are. Uh, you know, squarely within this sort of storyteller's tradition, you know, and, and then more, uh, in a more contemporary sense, you know, the, the role is to uh, start to weave together the, the, the distinct domains of human experience and the different fields of inquiry and to try and, and uh, help people find themselves within a new cosmology, you know, in the sense that, you know, cosmology, the word, you know, means, you know, universe story, you know, and so a, 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 good, uni a good cosmology not only tells you about how things, you know, where things came from and how they got to be this way, but what role each of us play in that larger uh, story or picture uh, or symphony or you know whatever and just being able to fluidly uh, adjust to metaphor is uh, one of my biggest inspirations is the cultural historian William Irwin Thompson mm -hmm. and he likened it to basically juggling ideas you know holding a, a worldview lightly enough that you're able to you know let re to release it and catch another one and that that there is a, a you know a performative aspect to this that it's it's actually you know bringing these things together is is almost like a 
Well, the term has been thrown around recently. It's like mind jazz, you know? Mm. But, I mean, it's not really separate from jazz. I mean, in the sense that jazz itself was a, a form of music that came out that evolved at a time when we were just recovering from the First World War and we were, you know, moving into this really uh, more mature and kind of complex relationship to the modern world and specifically the fruits of, of industry and global civilization. And uh, it was, uh, one of my favorite words is dark bright. You know, there was this, like, this sort of desperate joy or this, uh, you know, real, like, visceral, like, sex in a broken elevator kind of <laughs> vibe to all of it. You know, and I think that that's, that, that's that, the character of the, of the 20s where, you know, there was, you know, so many people were, were lost in an escapist indulgence rather than, because, because the, the, the palpable and visceral sense that we're living in this sort of apocalyptic time is very much the way things are now. You know, that there's a real strong emotional through line um, now that we're involved in this sort of like constant ambient World War III cyber attack, you know, fugue and, and it's just, um, you know, we're, everyone's afraid of the, you know, this week in world robot domination, and yet we're in this like amazing creative efflorescence, you know. So it really, this whole notion of the 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 common identity of creation and destruction, and and how there is a, a common character to these periods of really intense transformation and accelerated change, uh, seem to produce uh, these improvisational artists who are, you know, just pulling willy-nilly from different musical traditions or philosophical traditions. And uh, it's it's real fun to be a part of that. And um, so I guess that's... Well, you're, you're really a part of that on multiple levels because <laughs> you're a musician and an artist and, and motivational speaker. So you're kind of like really pushing along some major transformations for a lot of people, and especially in the festival scene. Well, I think the, the problem with, like, the motivational speaker thing is just the connotation, you know? Like, I don't have a book to sell. Um, <laughs> I'm not really interested in, in the industry of self-help in the sense that it's a, uh, you know, it perpetuates a social, the, the social construction of disorder, you know, just like the pharmaceutical industry does, you know, and books in a sense are drugs because they're, they're something that you, you take in order to change the, the faults of the pers the person you perceive yourself to be, you know, and, um, you know, I'm not really, I mean, yeah, uh, I guess I, you know, I fall into that category in the same sense that I would fall into the category of like a new age musician. Um, but for me, it's just more, it's just more interesting to, um, share in my abundance of curiosity and, and my enthusiasm for the world and, uh, you know, knowing that, that, that to really stand in it in that sense that, uh, like Elizabeth Gilbert's Ted talk on, on creative genius and, um, you know, to be like in, to be possessed by uh, the spirit of something like that is is uh, contagious. You know, I mean, we're social creatures, and it's just easy for us to to um, you know that sense of charisma or animal magnetism. You know, to get really to be really inspired and to share that inspiration is is uh, a pretty wonderful alternative to being um, miserable and lost. So it's motivational in that sense. It's it's what keeps me from just spending my day asleep on the couch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, one of the things that I I heard about, I think this was during one of your workshops or one of your talks during Gratify in 2014. You mm -hmm. mentioned uh, art or uh, entertainment as social action. Yeah. Get a little bit more into that. 
I just published, I'm, I've actually done three, I, I, I do talks by the year, so I'll take a topic, and then that was my, that was my topic for the year last year, mm -hmm. and so there's, um, there's a, a series of talks loosely constellated around that theme, um, which you can find on my website um, for free. And this last one, the one from Gratify, was was uh, probably the third or fourth that I'd done, and so it was starting to crystallize into a talk specifically about um, media theory and the way that you know, just just being aware of the way that we are vulnerable to one another in our communications. You know, just the way that uh, every work of art or every act of communication uh, is a vector of some perspective. That it, it, it uh, you know, in the sense that it's like, uh, was it uh, Doug Rushkoff and Seth Godin and, and Noam Chomsky and Marshall McLuhan, all these media theorists talk about, about you know, idea viruses you know, and um, epidemiological metaphor is, is actually really relevant here. You know, it's, it's very easy um, to, like, watch the Super Bowl and contract a case of talking about Katy Perry, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. Uh, and, and so there's, like, a responsibility that, that uh, really skilled communicators realize that they have and they either you know in the sense that language is sort of the ultimate and the the primordial technology you know it's it really is the first thing that we ever developed in order to relate uh, to operate on the natural world and so like all technologies it has its its you know bright side and its dark side it can be used as a force for liberation or it can be used to uh, control other minds and enslave them and limit the the you know the sphere of their possibilities. And uh, so that that particular lecture is just goes in a sort of different place every time. But I'm really interested in updating the idea of magic. You know, I'm I'm follow like graphic novelist Alan Moore. I don't know if you guys are familiar with his work, but he kind of popularized the comic book as a legitimate form of literature. And he wrote the, the books from which uh, Watchmen and V for Vendetta and a lot of these, these other really, these sort of popular postmodern uh, comic book movies were based. And he considers himself not an artist or a writer, but a magician Mm. And that that artist that art and religion and science are all actually sort of like subcategories of magic, which is basically you know in its in its purest sense just the use of language to affect a change in consciousness. Mm. You know, so like you can't really you can't really connect the modern world to the pre-modern world, art, science, and religion. And uh, you know our you know our role as communicators without it, using a really convenient shorthand of magic, you know. And so there's there's lots of really excellent examples out there of people that are that are using communications media to inspire and in, illuminate and to to. Uh, you know, help other people explore a, a wider range of human potential. You know, like the vi the entire visionary art movement is an attempt to to like reclaim and, and integrate and expand upon our inheritance as human beings. Um, and and so that's very much a case of like white magic communication. I and, even, um, and just ask you real quick, uh, I. I was curious about what the difference is between a, a visionary artist and just a um, an artist. Uh, what does it take to be a visionary artist? 
Uh, well, you have to be pretentious. <laughs> um, because, <laughs> because, like, visionary... Well, no, I mean, the, the thing is that, like, there really is an important difference between... I think probably the, the main difference is between visionary art and modern art. Now, I think, like, most people who would actually self-describe as a visionary artist um, would would anchor what they're doing in religious art, which dates back to, you know, cave paintings, which were a, you know, a magical... They served a magical function. You know, they were part of a, a, a ritual experience. And, uh, you know, we're in that sense... You know, you've got, you know, pretty much any uh, iconic or aniconic religious art within a particular tradition can be seen as as a an ancestor or an, an antecessor to the modern visionary art movement. But I think what really separates, what really sets it apart, is that visionary art draws from multiple historical art trajectories, you know, like, you know, you, visionary artists are, like the jazz musicians I was talking about earlier, are, um, they feel like the entire history of the human species is available for, you know, as our inheritance and as something that we can draw from in our, in articulating these transcultural statements about, you know, what it means to be human and about the nature of, of the human condition. So um, it's overtly spiritual, um, and yet it is not, it's a post-religious spirituality. It's not, it's not identified with any particular tradition. Um, it, it transcends and includes both uh, religious and secular perspectives. And I think, like, the best way to that I've managed to wrap my head around it is that, like, if you think about the emergence of perspective in modern art, in, like, realist painting, you know, you've got, you move from this sort of, you know, like the Egyptian hieroglyphic or, or like, medieval Christian two-dimensional iconic artwork to something where it, you have an actual scene where people are, like, sitting closer or further away, and there are lines of perspective moving towards the horizon. Well, visionary art is adds a dimension to, to that. And rather than the you know the one-dimensional point that stretches into a two-dimensional line that that you know describes a plane, you know, so we create this three-dimensional space, we have the the symbols and the figures of the mythologies of these different traditions that are like a you know a two-dimensional glyph moving through time to the place on the horizon of our collective inheritance of cultures where all of the different traditions and, and perspectives within the human experience meet on this this like horizon of knowing you know, that it's like everything is pointing to this uh, transcendent, you know, what, like Terence McKenna called the uh, the eschatological object at the end of time. You know, and that, like, all visionary art is is didactic. It's, a, it's um, used specifically for teaching in a way that modern art is not. So, like, even though visionary art is... Um, you know, it, it comes up around the same time in history as modern art. Uh, modern art is an explicit rejection or refusal of the the re, the pre-modern requirement that art means something or say something. You know, um, whereas visionary art, uh, you know, realizes that art has this this uh, profound responsibility to mean something and say something. And it, in fact, is a far better vehicle for instruction than 
you know, simply standing up on stage and lecturing people. And that, that uh, you know, if we really want to make meaning, you know, that it, if we want to make sense of our world, that it's, it's a profound instrument for that that we really can't deny, you know. So, like, modern art is, um, you know, sort of the whatever of art. You know, it's it's a it's a statement of the uh, apathy and the confusion of the modern era, whereas visionary art is a a a reconstruction of like you know a deeper significance that's not necessarily pinned to any particular orthodoxy. You know, mm. does that? I mean, that's my opinion. Yeah, definitely. Uh, sure. I love that a lot because um, uh, I didn't really get into art until after what I call a spiritual awakening. So um, to to hear your definition of visionary artists and modern art is is wonderful. Did you have any thoughts about that? I thought it was interesting. We started talking about hieroglyphs and different things, and people in our chat room were like, "He's got someone on this pillar behind him," and they're like pointing out the pillar and making. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's really weird. I don't. <laughs> I don't think they mean anything. Um, there's one that looks like a moose. I don't, I don't think they had moose in Egypt, but. I mean, they <laughs> but it bears in mind, you know. I mean, just just this whole notion of like um, Elaine de Baton is somebody who's who's talked a lot about this in the recent years, and just how like, you know, we have, we've, in the last century or so, decided that the art museum is not allowed to make a statement. And it's sort of attached to this idea that, um, you know, that science is supposedly objective or anthropology is supposedly objective. This whole modern notion of the view from nowhere, you know, which is the, like, logical ex conclusion is, like, the furthest that you can take this whole notion of, like, the separation of spirit and matter and you know, mind from body, and we've hit, we've like bottomed out with that, and so uh, you know, visionary art is part of this movement in in multiple domains of of human praxis to uh, reclaim the sacred in a way that honors the lessons and the discoveries of the rational enlightenment, and like you know, doesn't throw away everything that we've learned over the last few hundred years, you know, but um, but doesn't just bottom out in irony and despair, you know. Uh, I, I was into uh, angel channelings for a while, and I read one of them that said, uh, the new leaders of this new world are going to be the artists and the musicians. So... Tell that to Spotify. <laughs> I mean, I hope so, but I mean, another Bill Thompson thing is that, uh, you know, when you're coming up the mountain, the temple might, at the top of the mountain, might look like it's right there, but you still have all these switchbacks that you got to walk, you know? And so the problem with, with uh, channelings and prophecy in general is that it's really, really hard to tell you know, objects in mirror may be like thousands of years further away than they appear, you know, and, and um, you know, right now, you know, people like Jaron Lanier uh, are making really, you know, passionate defenses about just how much internet culture, you know, specifically Silicon Valley culture and the, you know, the automation of, the human of human labor is actually, um, you know, uh, disempowering the creative class and and uh, you know really threatening our our dignity and, and our integrity as as artists specifically and as human beings more generally. So I mean we're in crisis mode as far as that goes, but a crisis is an opportunity. So. Hopefully your guides were right, and I live to see it. Yeah, I really do feel that way. But uh, you had something that you wanted. To... Uh, I just wanted to ask him um, from an artist's point of view. You, we were talking about you being a visionary artist. Um, I, I think 
what I saw, most of your artwork is done in is paint marker. Is that your, your medium of choice? I've had this Wacom tablet for like six years, and I finally just picked it up this week for a commission. And so I'm, I'm like dipping my toes into the, the digital waters. But yeah, um, since I started working in, in like large formats and in public environments, it's been mostly paint marker stuff just because, one, I really enjoy limiting myself um, and exploring, you know, pushing the envelope of, of those limitations. And then, two, because I've been so scattered in my, my numerous loves and, that I'm worried about dilettantism and I don't I don't want to try and master absolutely everything I figure it, it makes more sense to to be really good at you know paint markers and absolutely horrible with the brush I mean you get some really good detail with your, your paint markers um, something else I wanted to comment on you were one of the first people I saw in the festival realm to do um, custom hats and things like that. Is there a reason that you, you decided to get into that? Did you see someone else do it? Just uh, Yeah, I mean, I've got lots of friends that, that do it. Um, Tyler Risto here in Austin is probably, like, as far as I'm concerned, the grandmaster of hat painters. Um, and I think it's a phase that a lot of us go through simply because uh, functional wearable art is... You know, it's, it's part of that whole issue of, like, you know, art on a wall is great, you know. Art that doesn't mean anything is also pretty great. But art that teaches or art that's, like, useful in some way, art that you can, like, adorn yourself with. I have a, I have a major respect for, like, fashion designers now that I didn't um, when, I, when I started painting. Uh, because, you know, it's, it's a much more integrated form, ultimately. But, I mean, I only started doing it because people were asking for me to do it. And right. I needed the money. You're really <laughs> good at it. And I know um, in, we're from, like, the East Coast and stuff like that. And when I first started getting into painting, I had someone say, hey, can you do a hat? Can it be as good as Michael Garfield? But I was like, just hats? I've already seen all this other stuff. I haven't seen those yet. And then you became, like, one of the names on the East Coast, at least, for doing hats and different things. So. Well, thanks. I kind of slowed down on it because everybody was asking me to do base nectar hats. <laughs> I was actually just telling him about that. I was like, I never would have wanted me to do base nectar hats, and then I understood why he hated doing them so much. I was like, you know, I mean, I mean, I would, you know, it's just the same it, thing. It started. It started. It, you know, while I can appreciate the challenge of doing the same thing over and over and making it totally different every time, um, again, it gets back to this issue of like. The the this the symbolic importance of like someone else's logo, you know, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I, it's just been my personal preference that if somebody comes to me with some with a design and they really want me to make them something that's totally unique and is totally personal, that it be something that uh, speaks to them on a deeper level than that. You know, then it's, this says something more than it, than just like a, a sports team hat would, or you know the logo of the, of their favorite band or whatever. It just, you know, I'd really I'd like to go deeper with it, but, um, you know, commercial considerations take priority sometimes. Yeah. So, if you are going to ask, if you're watching this and you you want a hat, mm -hmm. I would rather do your spirit animal than a than. A, a logo, but I love you either way. <laughs> you did an owl one, and it caught my eye. It was one of my favorites. I think it was an owl, and you did a, uh, I think a couple dinosaurs, which were really cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. And I really like your leggings. I have to get myself a pair of those. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Artist Threads is doing some really, some really cool leggings, and and um, they got some hoodies right now as well. So. Yeah, it's nice that I've got I've got friends that that uh, own or work with those really like awesome dye sublimation printers, you know. But then that's also sort of an arms race among artists, you know. That's like who can make the most like ridiculous, psychedelically vibrant 
clothing, and I'm kind of, you know, it's always like, well, where's where's the untouched thing? I mean, personally, I would rather, and you know, getting back to you know, my own purpose versus like where I found myself in my career due to commercial concerns. Like, I'd rather div- you know, dedicate as little as possible or encourage as little as possible um, the sort of cycle of endless buying, you know. And I would really, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna make merchandise, you know, I really, I want to start thinking more about, you know, merchandise that sort of puts itself out of business. You know, it's like. What you know, I really love the idea of like this is the last thing you'll ever buy of this. You know, I have this compass that was made by Brunton. Um, you know, and they stopped making these like metal compasses probably 15, 20 years ago, and you can only get these cheap plastic ones now. But I have this device, and it's like a like a it's it's a magical relic. You know, like I consider it like holy in a sense, just because it's so finely made. And and I'd like to explore more of, of that kind of thing, you know, maybe like laser engraving designs on, on uh, you know, objects of, of like ritual significance that can, that can, you know, become a part of someone's life in a longer, in a more lasting and, and uh, evolving way that, that, gain meaning over time rather than just getting replaced by, you know, next season's even more neon psychedelic apparel, you know. No no offense to my friends because they do great work. Yeah. And people can find your uh, your apparel and things that you do have on michaelgarfield.net, right? Correct. Awesome. Yeah. I wanted to make sure it was .net, everybody. It's not .com. Right. <laughs> .com is a bizarre rabbit hole down a very different Michael Garfield. <laughs> Which is obviously apparently from Texas, too, because that really confused me a little bit earlier. The high-tech Yeah, it's very weird. I mean, in a sense, his, his website and mine exemplify the difference between Austin and Houston. <laughs> um, so I'm not saying don't visit his site. I mean, do <laughs> have some free time and, and enjoy the bizarre... Yeah. <laughs> for sure but yes guys you can check out his awesome clothes and there's people in the chat room saying spirit animal hats what and then someone said that their spirit animal was base nectar so you know where that all went <laughs> but um, to check out some of the hats and things and awesome other stuff that he does that we're talking about you can check that all out on michaelgarfield.net yes yeah, so, so uh, we got about uh, time for one more question and then we're going to do, I don't know if you've heard, the mustache segment. Um, no. <laughs> it'll be fun. So did you have uh, one last question that you would like to ask? Um, I think I'm good if you have one. Okay, yeah, I did. Um, one thing that I was, I was curious about was uh, your, your take on spirituality or if you had uh, a, a definition or just uh, some kind of insight on what you consider to be spirituality. <sighs> Take a second on that one. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, for me, and this is, you know, my my day gig right now is writing for this website, Globalish. Um, and our our emphasis is on examining. Uh, popular media through a lens of non-separation, you know. So, I mean, for some people, spirituality means, you know, a, you know, a relationship to the spirit realm or, you know, a transcendent dimension, something that infuses our, our like, everyday mundane world with meaning. But uh, I think... While there is a place for that, you know, and while it's important to recognize that these other worlds do in some valid and practical way, if not necessarily a provable, empirical way, exist, um, you know, that ideas are real 
and that they they have real traction and and uh, significance in our lives. Um, for me, like a real authentic spirituality is more about challenging the boundary between the constructs of self and other. You know, between these these categories that we learn um, from our culture and that we that we then take for granted as as like you know fact um, but every fact requires an interpretation and so this is this is a way of seeing and you know another and you know for all intents and purposes a truer way of seeing is one that embeds those differences within a a deeper and wider prior unity you know um, not this kind of like uh, naive spirituality in which everything is all one so it's all okay that's like a confusion of the absolute and the relative you know um, it may be absolutely okay that you know children die of starvation and that we're in you know in a constant state of you know global guerrilla warfare but it's not okay in any practical sense you know so like the the experience of you know what various wisdom traditions call non-duality you know it's it's not one and it's not two exactly it's it's um it's beyond those those it's beyond categories and 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 stories entirely and experiencing yourself and the the rest of your world emerge together in light of this deeper self and this deeper experience um, informs a way of being in the world that uh, is more prepared and more capable of addressing the practical concerns and the realities of our everyday existence. So for me, you know, spirituality is is at once both a fearless engagement of that which lies beyond any of our attempts to make sense of things, um, as well as a disposition with respect to the world that regards everything as sacred precisely because it is all precipitating within a uh, you know what what uh, like Genpo Roshi would call big mind or you know what Christian mystics would call the Godhead um, but it's not somewhere else it's 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 here you know and so everything is is holy and everything is profane mm -hmm. um, and so you know coming at the world that way um, really radically transforms the way that we relate to one another. It, it personalizes the other in a way that I, I that I I really strongly feel allows us to engage the world uh, more responsibly and and more successfully. Um, so now we're just going to have you used Google Effects before? Oh yeah. Awesome. And I would also like to invite Ashton uh, to come back on and take part in the mustache segment. <laughs> so, um, you just put a mustache on and you get to have fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we Lately we've been doing it where um, everybody will take a turn answering that one person's question, but I would like it if we could direct it to just one person so we don't take up too much time because uh, after this segment we'll do the questions because uh, we know people in the chat room want to ask you a few questions. So, if Ashton, if you can hear us, we'd like you to come back on. Can you give me the Ron Swanson mustache when it's my turn? But I think you had to put it on yourself. Oh, do I? Let's see. <laughs> yeah. um, it's in the facial hair segment, and you just click it, and I, it will attach right to your face. Even though us men already have our mustaches. There you go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, it always good the government. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot. Ashen, can you hear us? 
Um, okay. Yeah, but I, you can't see me or my mustache. That's true. It's okay. We know you have a beautiful mustache. We we'll see it. Anyway. Thanks. Okay, great. So I would, I would like, uh, like I said, just uh, if you, if it's your turn to ask a question, just direct it towards one person, so we don't take up too much time. And, uh, and I guess, uh, did you want to start, uh, Shannon? Uh, you got the mustache on. Okay, Michael, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. <laughs> I know, do you look like that? That's not my question. Um, do, you, do you believe in crystal energy, and if so, what is your favorite crystal? I believe in the placebo effect. Gotcha. And, um... You can still have it. I, I don't know, man. I remain... I remain uh, wait, do I have to... Is there a special mustache way to answer this? No, you have to say I must answer your question. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, uh, I love crystals. I gain a lot through contemplating them and, and just, you know, thinking about, um, in some kind of vague sense, the energies of, of the earth in general. Um, I remain a trained scientist, and so, um, you know, I would love to see more... Uh, research as we get a little bit more um, subtle and nuanced in our experimental methodologies about what exactly people are feeling when they talk about crystal energy, you know. Um, but, you know, a lot of that stuff is is not really accessible to, to uh, empirical methods as we currently use them. Um, that said, I do think there's a lot to be, you know, that there's something about the, you know, the, the field of meaning that has accumulated around these specific uh, associations, you know, over over time in history, and and uh, you know, for a fact, you know, like birthstones and that kind of thing, and it's interesting, um, you know, I am very very keyed into the the land, and you know, culture and mind. As a, as a geological phenomenon, you know, so, so stones of particular ages and places um, have a lot of meaning and, and significance to me, and, you know, I was uh, born in January, so I've always had a, a special fondness for garnets. Um, garnets are awesome. But, uh, but if I'm going to put my money on a horse uh, for the next 10 years, my money's on graphene as a... Uh, you know the the carbon sheet crystal as just like the absolutely astounding magical pixie dust of all possible rocks that's electrically conductive and flexible and transparent and it's just like it does whatever we want it to do it's ridiculous so i mean if i were going to like buy stocks in rocks <laughs> then uh i'd i'd stack mad blocks on graphene nice. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, awesome. Is it my turn to ask someone a question? How does that work? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. You can go ahead and ask any any one person. All right. All right. Chris, I must ask you a question. It's <laughs> uh, <laughs> amazing. What is your absolute best case scenario and be practical um, for the next 20 years of human civilization? Like, how do you think, like, what do you realistically imagine is, like, you know, like, with, like, a clear A to B, like, we could actually get there without any kind of, like, alien intervention or or, you know, apocalyptic, last-minute, you know, surprise. Like, <laughs> what, do you, what kind of world do you, do you, are you, like, really rooting for your kids to grow up in? Awesome. That's a, that's a really beautiful question. 20 years from now, um, personally, for, for me, I do enjoy space. Um, I'm very interested in space, and I'm very interested in space exploration. And uh, I've... I, I do a little bit of research on um, what's going on with SpaceX and NASA, 
and they have planned uh, for by 2020 they will explore Mars. But um, personally, I, b I believe that we can uh, even go past Mars and by 2020 create uh, wormhole technology um, to uh, sort of explore more than just our own galaxy and. And uh, so I would like it uh, if my kids could grow up in a time where uh, <laughs> this is practical. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, be exploring, you know, different different galaxies in, in this universe. Uh, <laughs> so that's that's my answer. Mm. Solid. Can I can I just interject a really quick follow up there? Yes. Have you read The Light of Other Days by Stephen Baxter and Arthur C. Clarke? Uh, no, I, I've read the, the Space Odyssey um, trilogy, but not that one. Highly recommended to anybody listening to this. It's a science fiction about the social implications and the consequences of inventing wormholes. Really? Wow. And like what happens to us as a, as a species when we can instantly view any other place or any other time. Yeah, what, what was the book called again? Called The Light of Other Days. Light of Other Days. And it is and it's probably like even if it's just a like a a metaphor for what we're going through with the internet and that kind of thing, it's kind of one of the it's one of the more interesting explorations of just like what happens when there's no such thing as privacy anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ashton, did you have a mustache? Um, I'm Should mustache you? Michael, a question. I'm curious what what kind of music you've been listening to. What are some of your favorite maybe up-and-coming artists? Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have to be like in the festival scene or anything, but <laughs> anything that's caught your ear. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Scrolling through... Uh, I am surrounded by amazing musicians in Austin, obviously. Um, Chipper Jones is on the up and up. They're a, a, a guitar, like a looping guitar and drums duo. Yeah. And they're really cool. Um, British band Duolog. I wrote an article on one of their music videos for Globalish, and I was really impressed with their thing. It's kind of a... Um, Sounds somewhat like the Tom York solo stuff. Wow. Um, but they've got, you know, it's it's really like I'm into I'm into stuff that's both really shimmery and beauty, pretty and beautiful, but then can like twist on a dime into some really like dark and creepy spaces. So they're good at that. Uh, Arathime, my buddy Bobby West, who oh, lives yeah, in yeah. Colorado, put out my favorite album of last year, Circadia. Um, and they, and he's, uh, he's just so good at what he does, and I hope that we he is so collaborate silly. soon. I was talking to him yesterday, we were playing a festival in May in uh, Colorado, and he's one of the silliest musicians I know. <laughs> yes, yeah. Absolutely silly. Um, him, Luke Redfield is a good friend of mine, he's a, uh, one of those classical, like, timeless, legendary American balladeers in, this, like, Towns of Anzant, Bob Dylan kind of tradition. Mm -hmm. Nice. He's put out a new album that's really good uh, called The Cartographer. Um, Odessa? They're, like, if you're yeah. into the more, like, club banger electronic stuff, I've been digging their stuff recently. Um, I mean... It's it's good, like, I, I'm not, like, passionate about it, you know, right. um, but, you know, if I were, it's it's, a, it's the kind of show that I'd like to paint at. Like, the energy is, is real good, and I can imagine it being, like, you know, a real fun, like, banger dance party. Um, right. And, uh, let's see, I mean, Sorn is another guy from Austin, uh, S-O-R-N-E. Morgan Sorn is just kind of on another world. 
uh, it's like if if like uh, somebody had some sort of like gruesome genetic experiment involving Trent Reznor and Jeff Buckley, um, you'd get Sorn, and he and I did a did music together for a, a theatrical production in Austin a couple years ago, and he's he's just. He's somebody that, like, wherever he goes, he just, like, automatically converts people into, like, raving fans. So i check him out. Wow, well, do. Um, awesome. And uh, I got I to gotta put a shout-out to my buddy Cello Joe from Berkeley, California. Mm-hmm. He's a, a looping cellist. And I just did his, his next, like, uh, poster art. And uh, we've played some shows together, and he's just – hes he, like, biked across Australia with his cello and a trailer on his bike. Mm-hmm. And, really? and uh, he beatboxes while he's playing, and he's just a really fun and interesting guy who just um, – he's got a really excellent uh, album of uh, duets with uh, an African harpist, Evan Greer, on his web page, if you look up Cello Joe, um, and that's a really beautiful recording. So, I mean, I could just keep going forever, but I won't. So, right. um, no, that's a good list. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So and um, the last guy you talked about sounded uh, well. Kind of reminded me of the um, the beatbox here from Pentatonix, the way you described him. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I don't know. It's that that whole that whole thing is just I really I really like uh, you know just guerrilla music or like the whole kind of circusy busking attitude of these mm-hmm. you know it's like you'd, there's one thing that for like people who achieve a, like technical perfection with really sophisticated equipment and you know and bring really you know, high production techniques into a performance setting. And there's another thing for people who can just, like, drop it and rock, you know, and right. and with very little, with very simple um, setups, you know, and can – people like Mike Dawes uh, who can play, like – or Andreas Kepsalis, who can play, like, three or four guitar parts simultaneously on one instrument and sound like an entire band and just, like yeah. – I, I don't really, you know, I don't need 70 pounds of guitar pedals, you know? <laughs> People like that give me hope. People like Joe, Joey Chang, uh, Cello Joe, give me hope for, like, you know, desert island concerts and that kind of thing. So, hmm. <laughs> um, I, I, we have one more mustache question. Right, you want your mustache? Okay, I guess, okay. Sorry. So we have one more mustache question, and then uh, and then we have a few questions from the audience if you have time for that, Michael. Um, and mm-hmm. Michael, I must ask you a question. Uh, do you feel that <clears throat> astrology, or uh, say, for example, I'm a Scorpio, um, do you feel that that truly affects uh, our characteristics or some of our traits? Yes. I mean, no, I mean, if you really want to get, if you want to get into it, um, my advice would be to uh, look up this book by Richard Tarnas called Cosmos and Psyche. And Richard Tarnas is one of the world's most respected historians. He wrote what is considered the definitive single volume history of Western philosophy called the, the Passion of the Western Mind. And his second book, uh, Cosmos and Psyche, took him 30 years to research. And he, you know, he, he went into just extraordinary depth correlating the movements of the planets with the, you know, the, the, events that historians consider to be of historical significance in civilization. Hmm. And, you know, in the introduction to that book, he makes the point that pretty much every high civilization, you know, um, be it ancient India or the Maya 
or the Greeks. Um, you know, every time the you know all of these you know the Egyptians, all of these cultures that we regard as the most advanced and developed cultures of the ancient world, all of them were like rabid astrologers. You know, all of them took that stuff very seriously, and that it's basically only because. Um, we in the last few hundred years have systematically divorced our inner life from the outer world and the you know the mind from nature that we have allowed ourselves to you know indulge in this delusion that those things don't matter you know most people um, when they you know most people criticize astrology on the basis that you know, there's no observable influence that distant stars could have on Earth. But very, you know, but uh, like astrologers like Rob Bresney have made the point that that uh, the stars are basically reference points and that what is actually typically a matter of concern for astrologers are the movements of the planets against the background of stars. You know, and so what we're actually dealing with here um, are most likely not necessarily a matter of even necessarily causative influence. You know, we're not talking about something out there um, causing something in our own internal lives necessarily, but we're talking about correlations between certain seasons or, uh, you know, and we know that that uh, people born at different times of years, of the, I mean, of, of the year, uh, have different biochemistries, you know, have different balances of neurotransmitters, and so they're, you know, they're going to cluster into, you know, basic personality types. People born at certain times of day, the same thing is true for, for that, you know. Um, so, you know, certain astro astrological stuff starts to make more sense in light of that. And then also, you know, if we like Richard Tarnas suggests that we do, if we look at it at the material world is not something that is occurring strictly outside of us, but as um, you know, the mind and nature bound in this this uh, you know as perspectives of this greater phenomenon, you know, of cosmos and, and psyche as two sides of the same event that the, the uh, movement and the, you know, the characteristics of the outer world and the characteristics of the inner world are bound to reflect one another. And so it's actually like a paradigm shift. Uh, it requires, uh, you, know, a, you know, that we migrate the scientific method into a completely different way of seeing the world than... than um, you know, then we've been using it for the last few hundred years, and that's like a whole other conversation. You know, like um, people like Charles Eisenstein have pretty soundly deconstructed the whole notion, for example, of the reproducibility of experiments. You know, because the world is so complex and there are so many factors involved that we can't ever actually run the same experiment twice. Mm -hmm. You know, and like once you actually start looking at it in that way. Um, you know, what most, you know, sort of scientistic minds um, consider science is, a, is actually a very limited slice of what is actually itself an evolving process and, uh, you know, almost more an ideal than, than an attainable reality. So... Uh, I mean, I think that the evidence is pretty well stacked in favor of there being some really intimate relationship between, um, you know, between the cosmic scale, the, you know, the macrocosm and, and the microcosmic scale of human events. But I think that, you know, we have to, like, uh, retrieve a lot of, you know, astrology just being one of those things, and then... You know, we have to retrieve a lot of things that we threw away from the pre-modern world when we moved into modernity and re-examine them um, with an open mind and basically, like, 
you know, it's it's a, it's the social shadow. It's what's been repressed um, for hundreds of years, and so it hasn't had time to catch up to the rest of our, you know, the rest of our our body of knowledge. And I think that you know, probably over the next fifty to a hundred years, um, you know, we will find the the means to start having discussions about astrology where it's no longer uh, taboo in light of scientific inquiry. The same thing is true of like psychic phenomena. You know, these things are transcultural shared experiences for humankind and it's just absurd to just deny them on the basis of some, you know, academic agreement that they don't exist. Uh, but you gotta, you know, like there are, there are legitimate rigorous scientists and there are quacky fools. Um, the same goes for astrologers. I mean, it's not just, you know, they don't all fall into one group, you know, but you gotta, you gotta find the people that actually know what they're talking about. Yeah. Really? Thank you. Um, so we'll go on to audience questions now, if that's okay with you, Michael. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Yeah, we have three questions from, from the audience. Um, the first question I have is from Marie, and it said, how did you first get into art? Because I just got into it, and I'm trying to learn to just go with the flow and not stress about it. <laughs> um, okay, go ahead. Uh, well, is there a way to, can, can I get a follow-up on that? Because is is this something that you're practicing already right now at home, alone, um, and and you're wanting to like explore more deeply, or is it something that you are um, really that's like really unfamiliar to you, and and like you're struggling to find that creative part of yourself? Um, I mean, that makes a big difference in in how. Uh, I don't know if you're still in there, uh, uh, Marie. But I mean, I guess you know, I my like I was, I was encouraged, and I noticed somebody else had a question about my parents and parental yes. approval. Um, my uh, my parents were always pretty encouraging of my creative side, and so I, you know, I was. You know, my parents bought me art supplies when I was a kid. They took me to museums and zoos and really encouraged my learning. And, you know, I grew up not really making much of a distinction between art and science to begin with. And so my curiosity for the natural world and for life in general um, was always uh, a part of, you know, was always sort of united with my my interest in expressing that that curiosity and exploring it through through um, creative arts you know so I think that like you know it was art's always gonna be hard if, if you're trying to be creative and it's always easy if you are able to tap into those things that actually, that inspire you, you know, um, it's, you know, the, the whole thing with writer's block is that writers are, you know, have this sort of like romantic notion of, of the spirit sort of coming upon you and granting you this, this like blessing of productivity. And there's some truth to that. Um, but, you know, there is a science to making yourself prone to those kind of experiences. You know, I mean, the best, the best uh, minds know the importance of, you know, getting out into nature and taking a walk. You know, and the fact that movement of the body stimulates movement of the mind because they're not separate. You know, the importance of keeping a dream journal, which is something I totally slack on. Yeah. But my roommate uh, Topher Sipes, who's a fantastic artist, will tell you. Um, is is really really key to maintaining his inspiration, and uh, I watch I listen to a lot of podcasts and watch a lot of documentaries. And the more that I can do to to feed my curiosity, the easier 
I find it to, uh, you know, the, the, the more I feel like I have to say something, to, you know, the more I have to make music, the more the more amazing musicians I listen to, the more I'm like, oh God, I, I struggle like going to concerts because I'm like, I gotta get home and write a song, yeah. you know, it's like it's, and like if you're really, you know, if you're if you're good at at feeding that curiosity, then it will be painful, um, and you had better carry some art supplies around with you at all times, yeah. or you're. So I live in constant misery. <laughs> <laughs> so true. I agree with that statement. Because when I don't have art supplies, I'm a sad person. <laughs> um, so but I think you answered uh, the second question. It was, uh, if, are your parents supportive? And how how would you approach parents who say are not so grounded with the like an artist musician lifestyle? Well, the thing. The thing about art for me is, like, I'm lucky that my parents are cool with what I'm doing, um, but because that has, because I have that already, it actually doesn't really satisfy me. And I actually, like, I feel like I find that same sort of emotional tension trying to communicate with people that don't, um, necessarily aren't, you know, na don't natively get what I'm saying, you know, like I, I really, um, it's not so much the seeking other people's approval as it is really learning to be a clear communicator and really learning to express an idea in a way that someone else can understand it, which means knowing your audience. Like I went off the, the rails a bunch of times in this conversation and just said things the way that I would say them to, you know, to the mirror because I am just <laughs> in front of this thing, you know. But, like, the more I get to know somebody, the more I'm able to express the things that interest me in a way that's relatable, that's personal to them, you know. And I think that that's really the, the ultimate challenge of artists or any kind of communicator. And so with, like, parents that don't, approve of an artistic lifestyle, the challenge is the same as it is, you know, for me when I'm trying to get an audience who's never met me and doesn't necessarily have any interest in the ideas that I possess to take a moment to stop and, and you know, and listen to my music or my ideas or like take some time with my art and, and, and ultimately it's a bid for someone else's, um, you know, you're trying to like spread your, you know, infect them with your your way of seeing the world and, and your enthusiasm for it. And if you're, uh, you know, if your parents are like, I mean, actually, my dad is a very practical person, and I think the only reason that he's he's uh, comfortable with the fact that I do this is because I'm somehow making a living at it. You know, and sometimes that that's what it is. It's not anything that you can say. You know, it's it's uh, you know the the practical reality of your parents love you and they're concerned for your ability to make your way in the world without their constant support because they're not always going to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, just demonstrating to them that you are thriving. Um, emotionally and financially to whatever degree um, I've noticed seems to make them pretty comfortable with with things much more comfortable with with your personal eccentricities you know because I mean if you're if you're totally failing at life then they're gonna blame it on the fact that you're an artist you know but it may not matter to them at all if you're doing really well yeah. so um, and it may not be the you know you may not be thriving professionally as an artist, but they're not going to think that you're a weirdo if you're. I mean, yeah, it's just it's 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 complicated, but it's actually really simple. Your parents just love you, and they want to know you're doing okay. Yeah, sure. I think totally we're all going through that. <laughs> yeah, totally agree. Um, I think the last question we had was from Roots McNiles, and it was simply, "Do you meditate?" I got caught in the, th the thread there. 
Uh, yeah, I, but not as much as I should. Let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. Um, you know, meditation these days uh, is as often a, a vehicle for escape as it is a, a way of establishing mindfulness and relating more intimately with our lives. And, um, you know, I've, I have been a very active practitioner of mindfulness in my life in general for the last decade or so um, on a daily basis. But I, I'm at 31, I'm old enough now to notice how I'm, I, I would have benefited from taking a personal meditative practice more seriously at an earlier age. Um, and yet, you know, um, I think that if you, you know, a lot of people mistake meditation uh, for personal development, you know, or they think that they think that it's it's a uh, you know a cure all for these other problems, and it really does you know whatever our whatever our you know our, our practices our, our mind body and spirit practices need to balance and complement one another, or they become you know the channel for you know our our like uh, addictive escapism to express itself you know and people that's that's why. Um, you know, probably why um, agreements like the Bodhisattva's vow that you will like stay in the world of suffering until all other beings are liberated. It's probably why that exists is because these these guys were leaving their monasteries to go up and meditate in the in the mountains, and that's essentially a sociopathic behavior. You know, it's like if you if you are um, able to help and you choose not to, how is that actually a how is that an expression of your realization that you are not separate from the rest of the world? You know, it's it's uh, it's a it's in a sense an utter failure. Like true true realization is is expressed through engagement because you're not avoiding the suffering. You know, you're not avoiding the, your you know the the your commitment to the insane laws of your society. Or you know, um, you know the, the the pain of intimacy with other people in relationship, or you know, like filing taxes. <laughs> you know, like if you can, you know. But so I mean, I uh, I think people have. I've been hanging out with this older gentleman that I kind of ran into. Um, like sitting on a bench one day, and we just got into conversation, and and he's been um, we meet up for coffee sometimes, and he's been in uh, pretty intense physical therapy, and you know on like a painkiller regimen. Uh, he's in he's in remission for bone cancer, and his doctor uh, is and you know like a. Indian fellow who told him, he's like, you need to start meditating. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, I don't know, like, I'm in my 60s. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You know, and there's this attitude in our culture, especially because we take this instrumental attitude towards spirituality, like, you know, with yoga, like people do yoga to get in shape. You know, they don't do it to like harmonize their mind and body as much, you know, like that, you know, I mean, in general, it's become this sort of like commercial pursuit of of like uh, magazine cover perfection or like the attainment of some spiritual ideal and the spiritual materialism infects our relationship to meditation and so he you know this guy this friend of mine is like I think I'm doing it wrong I'm like but, but you can't do it wrong you know like all it is 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 just being present and observant to the activity of your own mind it's just like being aware of your own awareness and you are going to express that uniquely 
and you know, and uh, it's really, you know, just the whole idea of like sort of the uh, the age of Aquarius or the second coming of Christ or whatever as this, you know, um, the awakening to the sacredness of each individual person, and you know that sort of like everyone's higher nature descends into them and is expressed in the way that we live in the world, um, you know, then, then everyone is a Buddha and, and, uh, you know, everyone's going to bring a different set of talents to these core sets of practices. So it's like, part of it is like getting out of this attitude for me anyway, I've been, I've wrestled a lot with, you know, um, I'm not doing the kind of meditations that I should be, or I'm not spending the correct amount of time in meditation, where, you know, really I think there's a lot to be said in the sort of like more um, labor worshiping Protestant American mythology for just getting into flow states and the satisfaction of work, you know, of like losing yourself and being fully present in activity, meaningful activity, you know, and and um, you know, I think that that's uh, it's really valid to understand that, like, you know, meditation can take any form. It doesn't mean you're just sitting there cross-legged. So I t I'm I'm, talk I'm talking to myself here because I'm like, <laughs> you know, you don't you don't sit down and count breaths frequently enough. Well, it's like, but you know. I am, you know, constantly rededicating myself to the presence of mind, you know. Awesome. Yeah, so, so thanks. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Michael Garfield, for your time and for allowing us to do this interview with you. We appreciate it. Yeah, well, thanks, guys. You, uh, you're you putting together a pretty epic compilation of podcasts here, so <laughs> I'm glad to be a part of it. Yeah. For sure, we got a good lineup for February. So you got Dixon's violin next week. Yep. I see that. <laughs> Give him my best. He's a he's a wonderful fellow. Perfect. We'll do that. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you again, and we're very honored to have you. And um, <clears throat> now we're just gonna do our, our solar flare update, our uh, cosmic energy forecast. Feel free to stay on for that if you'd like, Michael. But I don't feel like you have to. Okay. Cool. Beautiful. So uh, thank you for that. And, um, and thanks for being in the chat room and just being so open with your fans and willing to give such talks because I know we already touched on you're not a motivational speaker, but you're a very motivational person. So Thanks. Yeah, definitely. I, I noticed that uh, every time I, I would send a, an email back to you, every time I would get your newsletter, you would reply like right away. And I was like, whoa. And, like not many people do that. That's, that's really awesome. And it's important. It is important. Well, I'm, I haven't uh, I haven't yet caved to all of those invitations from the Illuminati to join their mind control cult. <laughs> and, but as soon as I do, you better believe it's going to be all like this and ignoring you. And uh, <laughs> well, you won't be able to speak. You'll have so many secrets. <laughs> <laughs> and Ashen, <I> that. 